Thank you, Jesus. Never take for granted when God chooses to speak through his vessels. Jeremiah chapter 24, verse 7. I often say this. I hope you do not get weary of hearing it. You shouldn't. People like to be applauded. You're the best people in the world to speak to. That went over like a lead balloon. I'll say it again where you believe it. You're the greatest people on the planet to speak to. I anticipate a great response as we turn our attention to heaven. Be transparent. I'm, I'm not here to tickle your ears this morning. I'm going to try to pull on your heartstrings a little bit. Let's read together. I will give them an heart to know me, that I am the Lord. They shall be my people. I will be their God, for they shall return unto me with their whole heart. I'll speak this morning from the subject. It'll make sense at the end. Mama, I'm coming home. You may be seated. Have you done anything that you did not want to do? <laughs> when? A couple of Sunday mornings ago, we were at home getting dressed for church, and my darling beautiful little girl Emma Claire came in and politely but very Andrewy told me daddy I don't want to go to church today <laughs> to which I responded it caught her off guard I don't either <laughs> that point she had no idea what to say <laughs> So I followed that up with, I'm going to church today because I love Jesus. He's my Lord. He's my Savior. I'm not going to church today, baby, because I want to be there. Baby girl, I'm not going to church today because I have to be there. Baby girl, I'm going today to be with Jesus. See, passion compels action. It always does. It fuels our responses. It governs who we are. And some people believe that the book of Leviticus is a tough read. Many people, when they can't sleep, read Chronicles. However, it is my opinion that the book of Jeremiah takes a backseat to none. <laughs> of the Bible's laborious reads. You study Jeremiah and you have to talk with a counselor or someone to encourage you. This guy's forbidden to marry. He's not allowed to give solace to anyone. He can't rejoice. That, that, that's what's in this book. The priests, or the spiritual people in life, were against him. Kings wanted him dead. He was thrown in a cistern and left to die. That's, you know, you don't wake up excited to read about Jeremiah. Some of the scriptures of Jeremiah are extremely troubling. Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 7. O oh Lord, thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. Thou art stronger than I, and hast prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone mocks me. You don't get excited about that. Or Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 10. Woe is me, 
my mother, you bore me a man of strife and a man of contention to the whole earth. I have neither lent on usury, nor men have lent to me on usury. Yet every one of them curses me. And we think we have it bad. Nobody ever pets Jeremiah on the back. His conversations consist of being cursed. Jeremiah 4, 18. Thy way and thy doings have procured these things unto thee. This is thy wickedness, because it is bitter, because it reacheth unto thine heart. No encouragement whatsoever. Surely these three verses are familiar to our own experiences. With great conviction, many, if not most, have felt deceived, as Jeremiah confessed in 20 and 7. Some believe that Jeremiah was actually in depression his entire life. Or, if you haven't been deceived or depressed, perhaps you have waged an internal battle, as did the prophet. Mama, why in the world did you bring me into this world? You put me in this mess. Why? The strife that I have to deal with. For sure, all of us have witnessed wickedness and the bitterness and the bitter heart. The world in which we live seems to be ever growing in wickedness. And the only hope we have is where sin abounds, grace is more. But for the sake of today and the sake of your situations, there is little hope in the writings of Jeremiah. And the only way in which we can thrive in life is to love. Even in these less than encouraging writings of Jeremiah, we discover in the midst of them an unlikely surprise. Jeremiah chapter 24, verse 6. I will set mine eyes upon them for good. And I, this is God speaking, will again bring them to this land. And I will build them and not pull them down. And I will plant them and not pluck them up. God fixed his eyes on them. Yes, they were subdued by the rule of Babylon. Yes, Jeremiah felt deceived, blamed his mother, and saw the wickedness of his surroundings. Yes, it was understood that of the Ten Commandments, all of them had been broken. No other gods before me? Fail. No idols? Fail. Honor his name? Fail. Keep the Sabbath holy? Fail. Honor your parents? Fail. Murder? Fail. Steal? Fail. Adultery? Fail. False witness? Fail. Covet? Fail. Literally a nation steeped in transgressions against God and a nation full of failure, a living picture of complete disobedience. But despite all of their contemptible actions, God was captivated by them. Jeremiah, tell the unbelievers Tell the disobedient. Tell those that have forsaken me and disobeyed me and turned their face against me. Tell my people, my eyes are on them for good. He had to remind Jeremiah of what had already been previously established in 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9. For the eyes 
of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart or whose love is toward him. Passion compels action. God did not need us, but he loved us. For God so loved the world. Oftentimes, I wish he would have written it individually or written it and left it blank without an ending because we too often look at it from a global perception and are blind to the individual application. And so to not embarrass you, God loved Andrew, the sinner. God loved Andrew, the rule breaker. God loved Andrew, the disobedient. How valuable may it have been had we read God loved and you fill in the blank instead of God so loved the world because when we think of it individually, it changes the whole perspective. It changes the whole point of view because it puts us into a position of where God's eyes were on us and God loved fill in the blank the addict. And God loved fill in the blank, the addicted. And God loved fill in the blank, the abuser. And God loved, and you can fill in the blank with your name because I'm not going to embarrass you, but God loved the adulterer and God loved the thief. And God loved that which coveted and God loved that which didn't honor. And God loved that which didn't keep his name holy. And God loved that which was disobedient. God loved you. His eyes are upon us. He is watching us. He sees us. There's no guilty verdict to those of us who yield to Christ. He is a personal, an individual Lord and Savior. That's who God is. And He loves you. And so from the continuance of 6, we go to 7. From the writing of 7... We learn of the inescapable riches of God. I will give them an heart to know me. That I am the Lord. They shall be my people. I will be their God. They shall return unto me with their whole heart. This scripture is a reaffirmation of his covenant formula. I will give them a heart to know me. Established With Abraham, I will give them a covenant. I will let them know that I am their God. They are my people. That is my covenant. I am the Lord. You are mine. Return unto me with a whole heart. And despite the misfortune suffered by Jeremiah and the nation of Israel, God had the audacity to take on his nature, take on his creative ability. To ignore or to turn his back, you would might say. God looked beyond all of that and God created in them a new heart. None but God has that ability. None but God has the authority or the kingship to create a new heart. The creation of this majestic vessel is too extreme for any. Because a new heart is void of anger, rage, malice. And slander. A new heart is full of love, it's full of joy, it's full of peace, it's full of long suffering, it's full of gentleness, it's full of goodness, and it's full of meekness. And it's full of temperance. Our priority should be a quest, a pursuit of a new heart. That knows God. For when the heart yearns to love God as he is revealed. And refuses to fashion itself a deity according to its pleasure. It learns or is revealed of who God is. For the primary inhibition demands knowledge. Demands understanding. To man's revelation of God rests not in the mind. 
It rests not in our abilities. It rests in our heart. It is the heart or it is our love that houses the darkness which frustrates the mind. And again, I'm not going to tickle your ears today. Because if we are not prudent, our hearts are overwhelmed with darkness. We are not wise. And if we are not careful, our hearts become consumed with the pleasures of this world. I'm not exempt. You kidding me? Don't be confused. Those of you that know me, no, I'm not exempt. I'm an avid sports fan. I was the knucklehead in the woods Friday hanging a deer stand in a hundred degree heat. What idiot does that? It's the pleasures of my heart. Because pleasure compels action. And it is our restraint of man's knowledge of God. It's our lack of love that inhibits our relationship with Him. It's our priorities that prevent us from experiencing who He is. It's our affinity. I'll be honest. I'll be transparent. I try to always be honest, so I'll be transparent. I enjoy watching the stock, the stock market rise and fall. <laughs> Not so much the pleasure of watching it fall, but the affinity, the pleasure of my heart, whether it be LSU, whether it be hanging a deer stand, whether it be chasing the next dollar, life is just a puff of smoke visible just for a moment and then it vanishes the ancient Greek aphorism was this know thyself written on the temple man know thyself and as well as that was said even for this understanding, we must first know God. Because the only way to know Him is to love Him. All true knowledge of God is attended by love for Him. Oh, that we would run today to Jesus with a desperate cry. Create in me a clean heart. Search me and know my love. If we love the Lord above and beyond all else, our secret is with Him and His secret is with us. Oh, that a fresh attraction of God would stir in our spirit. That a red hot passion for God would stir in us. Because passion compels action. King David loved God with consuming passion as the heart panteth after the water brooks. So panteth my soul after thee, O God. For it is complacency that is the antagonist of the soul. And love must be present or there will be no knowledge of God. It is the absolute that he waits to be loved. And so let us not leave him in waiting. Let us hasten to him. For our knowledge, Ephesus was recorded. But the question could be asked, why has your love waned, Ephesus? The accolades of Ephesus would be applauded by most. What a church. Founded by Paul, the apostle. 
the giant of the truth, tended to by Aquila and Priscilla, many believe. What a church. Study the history of what they did and what they endured and what they were resilient to. I encourage you. Go read about Ephesus. Go study Ephesus. God even talks about them. He knew their deeds. He bragged on them. You worked hard. You persevered. You shunned wickedness when everyone else participated. That's what you did. You did not weary in your well-doing, Ephesus. You were full of resilience. You did not compromise. And where most would applaud Ephesus, their duties were abrasive to him. Revelation 2 and 5. Remember, therefore, from whence you are fallen, and repent and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Surely we can take a note from this. Surely we can accept an application from this. Again, I won't embarrass you. I'll put myself on the visible pedestal. Would that when I walk off this campus, the candlestick that I carry remains bright. Would that when I leave your presence today, God doesn't remove the light in my life. For at some point I will encounter someone that is in darkness and woe be unto me if I am in darkness with them. Congratulations, old buddy, old pal. You know what the score was last night. You know where the deer's going to move tomorrow. You know maybe what the stock market might do tomorrow. Congratulations. Oh, we'll go even one better. Congratulations, Andrew. You prayed your prayer shift. Congratulations, buddy. You did a consecration this week. Congratulations. When everybody else around you was making bad choices, you succeeded. And God said, but if you left your first love, I'll pull that light from you. Because the priority isn't your actions. The priority isn't what you do. The priority is who you love. And the priority is where your heart is. And when your heart is in the right place, everything else will matter. But if your heart isn't with Him, if your heart isn't toward Him, if your priority, if your actions aren't driven by your passion, He says, I will remove my spirit from you. So oh God, let your hand be upon us that we not turn our back on you. Come, let us return to the Lord. Let him heal us. Let him revive us. Let him raise us up that we may live. Let us know and let us press on to the love of the Lord. He will visit us if we can learn to love him. You may not understand him. That's not the prerequisite to knowing him. To know him, we must love him. I don't want to go to church today, Daddy. I don't either, but I love him. I'm tired. I am too, but I love him. I'm going through hell, but I am too, but I love him. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't either, but I love him. One thing have I desired. That will I seek after, that I may know him, that I may dwell in his presence, that I may have relationship with him because passion compels action. So the guests, Oh, that you would love him. 
to the regular. Oh, that you would love him. To the elder and humble. Oh, that you would love him. Your eyes are upon us, Lord. Your presence is our greatest need. And my heart will seek you on the authority of your word. So revive us. Restore us. And create in us a new heart. To make sense of the title, for a few years I lived in Ruston, Louisiana and attended Louisiana Tech University. I was smart in one thing in life. I scheduled a Friday class early in the morning so I could get home. As long as my mind has some type of cognitive memory, I'll never forget the phone call at 9.50 that I would make as that class would come to an end and walking through the hallway out of the business building, I didn't care who was around me, it didn't matter to me. The phone call was made, anticipating the answer on the other end of the line. And I would always begin with this phrase, Mama, I'm coming home. Now, I was a little bit selfish in the, in the acknowledgement. There was some personal want in the statement, there was a little bit of greed, I guess you could say, in the phone call. Because I knew as soon as I talked to Mama and told Mama that I was coming home, Mama would start going to work. Now, there's a, a restaurant here in town that has the greatest mashed potatoes and gravy. And if you're in high school or college or junior high, you know what restaurant I'm talking about. For the sake of people that are business owners in here, I won't say publicly if you own a restaurant. It's no offense to you. It's just my personal opinion. As great as those mashed potatoes and gravy are, Cam, there were none on the planet that were as good as Mama's mashed potatoes and gravy. Not only would she fix for me some homemade mashed potatoes, there would be an amazing bowl of soup waiting on me. I don't know how long it took her. I don't know if she froze it. I don't know if she bought it somewhere. I don't know. I just knew when I got home, when I walked in the door, the whiff of the aroma of beautiful mashed potatoes and gravy, and whatever soup she had chosen to make that day, broccoli and cheddar. We're close to lunch. I'm sorry, y'all. <laughs> whatever it may be, when I walked in the door, I wasn't greeted with, why didn't you make a good grade this week? I wasn't greeted with, did you act right this week? <laughs> I wasn't greeted with, how many mistakes did you make this week? The first words I heard weren't condemnation. When I pulled in the driveway, I walked in the garage and walked in the door. Mama was waiting with me, waiting for me with open arms. Baby, I love you. Did you have a good week? Yeah, Mama. Mama. You don't want to know what I did. <laughs> I'll never forget it. There was never not one moment when I came home 
but the door was locked. There was never one moment of condemnation. There was never one moment of, I'm not going to love you today. There was never one moment of condemnation. Every time I walked in the door, baby, I love you. Come give me a hug. Baby, I'm glad you're home. You're my boy. I'm proud of you. I believe in you. I know he's not mama. Don't take me out of context. But when you woke up this morning and you started getting dressed, and the cares of this world said, You don't have to go today. And the burdens on you said, eh, just stay home today. And the life experiences arrested your attention, and for a brief moment, you said, I think I'm just going to stay here. But something in your heart overruled, and love brought you here today. And when you made the phone call, God started preparing. God started focusing his attention into this auditorium. His eyes are upon you. And Ezekiel will say it better than I, so we'll read it together as we stand. Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 19. I will give them one heart. I will put a new spirit within you. And I will take the stony heart out of their flesh. And I will give them a heart of flesh. Or for the application of this message, I will give them a heart of love. See, the beautiful thing about the Creator is His eyes are always upon us. We established that early on. The beautiful thing about the Creator is He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. He's omnipotent. That's beautiful and that's grand. But the amazing thing about the Creator, I will give you a new heart. I know you messed up. I'm your father. I know you've turned your back on me. I know you've been rebellious. I know maybe all ten have been disobeyed. But I love you. And so I'm going to create in you a new heart. So I haven't come to tickle your ears today. I've just come to tell you God loves you. I've come to inspire somebody today. God loves you. God wants to give you a new heart. I am your God. You are my people. I will be your God. I will give you a new heart. So if you'll do me a favor and reciprocate back to him and give back to him. See, it was easy when mama threw her arms out there was no reservation in me because I knew I'd probably messed up that week. I knew I'd probably erred that week, but Mama didn't see that. Mama just saw baby boy. Come here, baby. I love you. And so everything else fell into place at that moment. Okay, Mom, I love you too. If you're going to ignore all of that, if you're going to forget all of that, if you're going to choose to love me, even though you know because she was a praying machine. Even though you know. You still love me. So I'm going to give back to you. 
That's the application for today and the request for today. God knows every failure in here. God knows every addict in here. God knows the chiefest of the sinners in here. God knows every one of us individually. And God loved the world, yes. But God also loved the individual. And if you'll take a moment and open your arms and receive Him, the response is what no one else can do. I will give you a new heart. I will remove a heart of stone and I will give you a new heart. To know Him is to love Him. And to love Him is to know Him. So I can, if I can have just a quick response from you, I'll let you determine your response of love. I'll let you define what it means to you. But if you can ignore the restraint of the adversary, and if you can put behind you the burden of life, and if you can withhold from walking out those doors for a, just a few moments, I can give you an absolute that God will reciprocate back to you unfailing love. The weight of the sin does not matter in His eyes. The burden of who you are does not determine the response of His love. So if you will yield to Him, if you will surrender Him, God in turn will create what no other can create and God will give a new heart. Come on, would you respond right now? Guest, webcast, regular, young, new couple, elder, band, worship team, speaker, can we fall in love with Jesus? Can we set some priorities in our life today? Oh, that we would love Him. That we would know Him. That we would receive Him. That a cry would come from our innermost being. That nothing else takes priority. Nothing else takes precedent. Yeah.